Recently, FEMA released their strategic plan for 2018 through 2022. And the number one goal in that plan was to build a culture of preparedness. Well, how do you do that? And from that, I get two takeaways. One is how important disaster preparedness is to all phases of emergency management. And two, that we need to build it. That means that we're behind. We need to take action and we need to do something about it. But I believe, and I think others in here agree with me, that the way to build a culture of preparedness is to really focus on youth and focus on children, including you in this audience. So I want you to take a look at what is on the screen here and think about what these items might have in common. Now, some of you might be more familiar with these symbols than others, particularly if you were a student in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, these things should look familiar, right? But what I see here is I see very common symbols, things that we would say are part of our culture now. They're not out of the, not out of the ordinary. I see health campaigns and safety campaigns. But really what it comes down to are, these are three examples of successful public health campaigns that successfully targeted and then mobilized youth, harnessing the power of youth to make cultural change. So the first one you see on here is Smokey the Bear. Smokey the Bear was in our schools, he was in cartoons, he was in coloring books, so that we know that only you can prevent forest fires. We have seatbelts. It's one of the first safety lessons we learned as children today. And you might remember the crash test dummy PSA campaign, where you could see the effects of a crash when you don't wear a seatbelt, but it was done so in a way that wasn't too graphic. And then, of course, the anti-smoking campaign. If you've taken a health class in the, in the school, you've probably learned about the adverse effects of smoking on your health. And really, we made this a, a worldwide campaign in terms of we're, we're not even targeting youth media anymore with smoking. You're not allowed to show someone smoking in, in TV shows or movies under a certain rating. So when we think about really changing culture, why should emergency preparedness be any different? We need to think about children and we need to think about the systems and programs that are serving children and we need to have a significant shift in thinking. So, I think particularly for emergency management, we take kids for granted. Yes, we think of them as a vulnerable population, and that is true. Particularly for the youngest children, they have special and unique needs that need to be purposely planned for. So, for example, kids need, babies need diapers, they might need cribs, they might need help evacuating a building, and that means you have to make a, a specific plan for that type of thing. But part of what makes kids unique is actually what makes them the most powerful. So kids love to learn. They love to share what they learned. That means that they can be really good at bringing home preparedness messages. Kids like to be part of the plan. They want to help. They want to do something. They want to be useful. That means that they can be good emergency actors. So when something happens, they can respond. And children can be safety advocates. And part of what makes them vulnerable actually makes them more compelling. When their safety is at risk, they want to do something about it, and we want to hear what they want to do about it. And children are a critical community link. So think about it. It's not just about preparing children themselves, but think of all the services and programs that touch children's lives, whether that's schools or hospitals or uh, community organizations. When we think about preparing kids, if we can get all of those entities working together around kids, we're actually strengthening the fabric of the whole community. Children are a great mobilizer. So at Save the Children, we have a youth preparedness education program. It's called the Prep Rally, and it teaches kids in kindergarten through grades five basic preparedness skills so that they can share those with their families. But because of that, I'm frequently asked many questions of, why do we need this program? And I realize that there's many misconceptions out there about youth preparedness programming. One is that it's too scary. Why in the world would we teach kids about disasters? You know, and first I want you to think about that and see if you can come up with an answer. But what it comes down to is, yes, disasters are scary. It's normal to be scared in those situations. And kids should know that it's OK to be scared in those situations. But research shows that when we teach kids basic preparedness skills, they're better equipped to respond to a disaster, 
and cope with the disaster afterwards. It's taking away the surprise of the unknown. Yes, we need to be considerate of children or, or youth who have experienced certain events or have a certain mental health disposition and be sensitive to those. It, not all disaster preparedness education might not be the right fit for everyone. But again, when it comes down to it, facing the unknown without the guidance, without the reassurance that somebody's working to keep them safe, is ultimately more scary than not preparing in advance. Another thing that I hear is, we're already prepared. Guess what? <laughs> Data shows that less than half of American families currently have an emergency plan. I would ask all of you to raise your hands if you have an emergency plan, but it, it actually turns out that that's actually probably an overreported number. And when it comes to preparedness, it's not just about having a plan, it's about an ongoing activity. It's about practicing that plan, maintaining that plan. And those principles apply to youth preparedness education as well. We can't say, good job, everyone, you did your monthly fire drill, you're probably set for anything. No, we need to think about multi-hazard education that's repeated so that you can be ready for different types of disasters and different types of scenarios. And there's other studies that show that kids who participate in multiple preparedness interventions, more than two, two or more, that they're better able to retain that knowledge and put it into practice. It's an ongoing activity. And then another thing that I hear is, my child is safe with me. Well, that's great. That's great when your kids are with you. But guess what? Today and every other workday in the US, there's 69 million kids in school or childcare away from their parents. If you want a parent to take action, have them think about, where is your, your child right now? And what would happen if a disaster happened? Would you know what to do? Would you know what's happening at your child's school? And guess what, 41% of parents say, actually, no, I don't know where my school's evacuation site is. I'm not familiar with my school's evacuation plan. Yes, as adults, we need to be responsible and make sure that we're putting plans in place to prepare kids, but kids are in a, such a variety of environments, we need to equip them with the skills that they need to be prepared no matter where they are. So I've, ha I've had many of, the, of these conversations over my career, but when it comes down to it, there's no satisfactory excuse for not investing in youth preparedness education. Going back to some of my, my key points, the first is that kids are really good at bringing home messages. They're great message bearers. And this is because kids love to learn. If you have a child yourself, or even if you have a little brother or a little sister, you know how excited they are to share with you every single detail of what happened that day. You know that they love to ask a lot of questions. So why not give them something that's really worth learning, really worth sharing about? And the good news is, is that families of kids who bring home just one preparedness resource are 75% more likely to have an emergency plan. If you remember, I just said that less than half of families currently have a plan. That's a huge rise. That's a huge difference. It shows how far we are behind. If I'm an emergency manager, I'm thinking about what are the other critical messages that I need to be getting into children's hands to bring home? How do I use schools to bring home um, information about critical warning systems, for example? But some things that we do have to keep in mind when we're doing programming for youth preparedness. One is that we need to focus on safety. We don't need to use fear tactics to inspire children to action but making sure that kids know that what we're doing, we're doing so that we can have the skills to be safe, keep our families safe, and keep others safe. Another thing is that we need to link to learning. Kids are in so many programs already, in so many uh, classrooms. If we can connect preparedness into what they're already learning, the more likely it is to be integrated into an ongoing curriculum and be a sustainable program. So think about how you connect preparedness to a, a science curriculum, a geography curriculum, or even a health curriculum about public health and how you stay safe. Always be reassuring. Yes, we're teaching kids preparedness skills so that they can take action, but when it comes down to it, they're still kids and we're adults and we're responsible for them. And they need to know that in case of an emergency, it's not up to them to save themselves that there'll be caring adults like teachers or first responders working to keep them safe. It's that underlying message of reassurance that makes sure that kids can learn in feeling safe and feeling like they can do something about it. 
And lastly, have fun. How many of you think about having fun during emergency preparedness? Probably not. You probably have not experienced it. But the truth is, when you can make a preparedness activity fun, kids are more likely to retain it, and it's more likely to normalize the behavior so it doesn't seem so foreign when you have to take action. So whether it's having a disaster supply relay race so kids can know what needs to go in their disaster go bag, or having a drill and trying to do it quickly next time or, or more quickly next time so that you can time it and improve as you go, make it a competition. Those are all acceptable ways to help include emergency preparedness into a curriculum. And so let's think about how are we going to get messages in the hands of kids so that they can get home to the families that we serve. Children are also capable emergency actors. Kids want to play a role in your plan. Give them the skills that they need to do so. By doing so, you're empowering them to take action. And what we have here is the levels of safety awareness from our friends at Safe and Sound School. And what, and what you can see here is that from very early ages, kids can take simple steps to play a role in response. So even from pre-K to kindergarten, kids know the difference between evacuation and shelter in place. And they can follow instruction to do those safety actions. As you move up towards upper elementary school, kids can close doors, they can grab emergency supplies, they can turn off lights, they can move furniture. And of course, as you move up that uh, continuum in middle school, high school, you can make more independent decisions, you can take more independent actions. And why is this so important? Think about where kids spend most of their time. They're in environments where they out greatly outnumber their caregivers, where they greatly outnumber their teachers. So if they can play a role in response and know what to do, it all ultimately improves the safety outcomes for the community that they're in. And kids can save lives. You've probably heard stories of that on the news before, how uh, you know, a child heard a, a fire alarm and got people to safety. But one example of this and one example of successful preparedness education is following the 2004 Thailand tsunami. So during that tsunami, there was a girl named Tilly Smith, who was 10 years old at the time, on the beach on vacation with her family. She was looking out over the water and noticed that something just wasn't quite right. She had heard something about this before, and it clicked for her that what she was witnessing is the warning signs of, of tsunami and that they need to get out. She warned her family, she warned the people around her, and in the end helped save the lives of nearly 100 tourists on the beach that day. 10 years old, was able to put that learning into practice and save people's lives. So what are we doing to empower children as emergency actors themselves? And children are very powerful advocates. Children are 25% of our population and 100% of our future. They are our future teachers. They are our future policymakers. They are the future of emergency management. They have very powerful voices, and when something threatens their safety, when their safety is at stake, we listen. An example of this is just a few months ago when students from Parkland, Florida, started a national movement around school safety. The world listened. But students and children are also powerful advocates among their peers. And an example of this is my friend Aria. Aria was only four years old, when the Moore, Oklahoma tornado ripped the roof off of her daycare center. Her life was saved because her care provider was holding onto the toilet and holding onto Aria's leg as she was being sucked out the roof. Now, that would be a traumatic experience for anyone. But for Aria, what helped her recover is that she knew that she could help other kids be prepared. She knew that she could help other kids stay safe. So she helped create a song and dance called the Prep Step, which teaches kids three basic steps that they can do to keep their family safe in emergencies. Last year, 100,000 kids did the Prep Step with Aria, and they are now more ready for disaster. Kids are powerful advocates. What they deem important right now, what they're learning about right now, what they see the adults in their lives value as important, is what's going to be ingrained in them to carry on with them in the future. It's going to be what they want to pass down to the next generation. Emergency preparedness needs to be part of that conversation. 
and needs to be part of what is normal. And children are a great community link. So the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, Columbia University, did a study and found that children are the bellwethers of resilience. What does that mean? It means after a disaster, how well children can cope and recover, and more, how quickly they can cope and recover, is a very good indication at how the overall community can recover. So what this means is, is not do we only need to prepare youth themselves. We have to prepare all the systems, programs, institutions that serve children so that they can be ready when a disaster happens, so that they're ready to recover. If you take a look at the graphic, it's not just about preparing youth themselves through education programs. It's about ensuring that those kids bring the messages home to their families, that their families have an emergency plan, that their families know what the plan is at their school and childcare, and that there's an open line of communication there, that schools and childcare have strong emergency plans themselves, and that they're a part of the community emergency plan, making sure that they're sitting on local emergency planning committees so that children have a voice, and then working collectively to ensure that at state and national levels, that policies are in place and regulations are in place to ensure that children can be safe before, during, and after disasters. It's a layered approach. It starts with children and it ends with children. They're the great connector. A very practical example of this is a project called Resilient Children, Resilient Communities, which Save the Children does in partnership with the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, Columbia University. And within this project, we run two uh, pilot communities, uh, community resilience coalitions that bring together multiple stakeholders from the, from the community. So this is representatives from health, hospitals, schools, childcare, juvenile justice, emergency management. They come together in the room and they, they talk about where are the gaps in protecting children in emergencies, and they create action plans to help address those gaps. And why it works is because it's community-led. It's community-driven. They know their strengths, they know their weaknesses, and they can plan to that. And that's why that program is sustainable. So when we think about children, it's not just about the children themselves. We need to make sure that we're supporting the community around them. And sometimes it's easier to motivate people around children than just for themselves. It's one thing if you ask somebody if they have an emergency plan, they're like, oh, I'm all right. But again, when you make it about their children or make it about protecting their future, the more likely to take action. So what can emergency managers do? They need to make a change, for sure. For one is they need to invest in youth. Right now, less than one cent of every $10 in preparedness grants is dedicated to children's safety. And that doesn't add up. If children are on average 25% of the population, they're not getting their fair share of the pot. And what it means is making sure that even if you're not investing specifically in youth preparedness programs, how are you supporting the services that serve children? Ensure that children have a voice at the emergency planning table. That's making sure that you have representatives from schools and childcare there. Maybe you have parents at your planning committee. Maybe you have students, teenagers, who want to voice their opinion. It's so important that you consider what their needs are and what they consider their, their biggest threats when you're doing that analysis. Make sure that they're, that they're there. And also, build relationships with child-serving institutions, particularly schools, particularly education settings. Why? You can help them with their emergency plans. You can let them know how you're working to take care of them. We need to strengthen those bonds between emergency management and child-serving institutions. Too often we say that we live in different worlds, we say we, we speak different languages. And to some extent that's true. That's why you need to build the bridge. As an emergency manager, you might not be the best person to talk to children about preparing. That's fine. There's a whole profession that, that is meant to. They're teachers. So if you can give them the resources and tools that they need to help provide that preparedness education, you're going to be better off and you're going to be stronger as a community. I think the good news here is that for emergency managers, you don't have to start from scratch. There's a movement going on. There's a groundswell of things that are taking place across the nation that is really promoting youth preparedness. One is this national strategy for youth preparedness education. 
It's led by FEMA, but it has 65 affirming organizations that work together to share resources, share programs, and maximize the collective impact of what we're doing for youth preparedness. And Save the Children is a proud affirmer of that group. And think about the, the organizations in your community who could either be a part of this strategy or benefit from the resources that are already available from these organizations. The second is the Youth Preparedness Council. Currently, there's a national level Youth Preparedness Council of about a dozen teenagers who have been empowered to take a leadership in community preparedness programs. That is, they get to decide where they want to make a difference in their community, and they run the program. But now we're seeing models of this being used across different FEMA regions and in even some specific states. Again, there's, this a, nice, there's a nice framework, there's a nice ideas for uh, youth projects that can be done. Use it. And, you know, we've been talking about all the things that you can do in youth preparedness programs, but guess what? There's already a lot out there. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. A lot of these resources are free. They're accessible. Just a few examples. Save the Children's Prep Rally Program, American Red Cross Pillowcase Project, FEMA STEP Program, Mississippi State University's My PI Program for middle school students. They're all out there, and there's even more. Take what you need, make sure it fits the needs of your community, but just because you don't have anything right now doesn't mean that you shouldn't go find one. You owe it to your community and you owe it to the youth to make sure that you can provide them that resource. So I just said a, a whole lot <laughs> really quickly, and when it comes down to it, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We can do more for kids, and we can do more with kids. We have to prioritize children. We have to ensure that we plan purposefully to meet their needs, and we have to invest in them. Because youth is the future of emergency management, and youth is the foundation in building a culture of preparedness. Thank you. And I think it's normal for kids to feel anxious when talking about these situations, but I think it's important to lay some ground rules in terms of, you know, making sure we're reassuring that there are people working to keep them safe, making sure that they know what their resources are, <laughs> as opposed to not letting them know what their resources are, is, um, is better in this, in this instance. I, I think, you know, again, the, the risk is out there. <laughs> the risk is out there no matter what we do. It's, what we can change is how we prepare for it. And I think, we, again, it's really about opening the dialogue. It's about listening with, to what the, the children and youth, what their fears are and what their perceptions are and talking that through. Creating a safe atmosphere where it's safe to hear what they think is important as well as give you know, practical guidance about what can be done. And I will say, you know, uh, one way that we do this, particularly for young children, to, to take the pressure off and make it a little less scary is we'll often read storybooks. So we'll use the characters in the story to talk about what happened, how did the character feel about this, what are the preparedness actions that they took, or what is the safety actions that they took. So it's not about the own experience of the person who is <laughs> receiving the education. They're able to learn through the character themselves. At Save the Children, first of all, we always welcome you to learn more about what we do. Go to savethechildren.org to find out more. Um, I'll say that one thing that you can do as, as a teenager is we actually train teenagers to run our prep rally program for younger kids. That's one of the best ways that we mobilize youth to do direct programming with other children in their community, and we can use it to get volunteers' hours out of it. And then, of course, you know, I, I can always say you can always host a fundraiser to support children in the U.S. or 120 countries around the world where we offer health program, education program, and disaster assistance. So thank you. Well, I will say that... Again, it's really important first that we listen to what the needs of the children are, to know what they need and what kind of assistance they need. As a community, we need to be prepared to offer referrals to those around us. So 
knowing where the mental health experts are, but where we can get uh, additional support. Knowing where there's a pediatric or even hospital support that can help kids. I, I think it's hard to put every situation in, in a box and say, this is exactly what you should do as well. Um, it's, it's something that we have to work on. I don't think it's something that we're, we're excellent at. Um, but listening to kids, reassuring kids is what it, we always kind of fall back on, making sure that they know that even if this bad thing happened, we're still here, we're creating a safe community for you, and we're going to be working to keep you safe and working to get you the, the supports that you need to get through it. Because um, kids are naturally resilient, but they need us around them to continue to provide that support. Thank you.